Morning, everyone. Hello. Hi, Anna. How are you doing? I'm Paul from ODI Leads. And you can probably spot the Open Data Sales Lives team or the ODI Leads teams with their backgrounds. Uh, we've got quite a few people booked on for today's session, so that's, that's good. Um, and we're now getting into our regular um, fortnightly um, Open Data Sales Lives um, sessions. And the way we usually run this is that we try and finish in 45 minutes. Um, there's no reason for it to run to an hour, um, just because of reasons. Um, and we'll give people till about three minutes to four minutes past 11 to be fast to relate to Open Data Saves Lives. If you haven't seen uh, what we've been doing previously, you can find out all about it handily on our Open Data Saves Lives webpage. So uh, if you go to the uh, web link there, open uh, odlease.org slash project slash open date saves lives slash COVID 19. We have all of the work we've been doing on open date saves lives here, all the online sessions. Um, this is our uh, how many sessions have we done now, Amy? Well, I think we've hit 12 sessions prior to having. A break so this must at least I'll have to go through and count them all actually now you've put me on the spot this must be at least <laughs> session 14 or 15 I think yeah and then there's loads of um, work that people have shared with us done with us or linked to so it's becoming a, um, a nice uh, resource for people to, uh, to use and um, today we've got um, three speakers uh, we've got Anna Powell Smith, who is talking about the Centre for Public Data. I think I've got that right, which um, I'm really interested in and in, in helping get the um, uh, the data infrastructure right for the. Um, so is it UK? Is it Great Britain? Is it England? So yeah, it's, uh, we, we've done the geography session, but yeah, that, that's um, um, uh, so we're really interested in that. We've got Tom White, who has been um, amazing during COVID of putting together a repo that we've used um, of all of the data that. Um, people were accessing about, about COVID. And we've got Henry Partridge from Truffa Data Lab who has built some cool um, coronavirus dashboards so people can understand what's going on as well. Um, and uh, just, so we've got data infrastructure, we've got people who've been trying to build some data infrastructure, we've got some people who've built some dashboards so people can try and understand the data. Um, and then at the end, we can maybe, um, we can take some questions and we'll also talk about what, what we might be doing next and what other people are doing next. Um, so we've got still people joining the, the call now at, through, through, the, through the waiting room. And um, I think it's really important today was about um, data, uh, data infrastructure and, and using data effectively. And I don't know about you, but my mum keeps asking me, is it safe? And um, I need to tell her. So we built some uh, dashboards at ODI Leeds, which keep breaking because the API at PHE England, um, PHE England is, um, we're not quite sure why it's going slow, but it, it seems to be um, not quite working in the way that they want. And we can't find, the static data is now out of date. So there's a, it's quite an interesting um, uh, thing going on there. Um, and I wonder if anyone else is, is using the PHE um, API to drive products to answer questions that people have um, so that'd be quite a nice question to have at the, at the end of the session. Um, and then we've got um, another, uh, we're going to be running an open data exercise every two weeks uh, from now on. So we've got, um, Amy, could you tell us who's going to be on in two weeks time? Uh, yes, so we've um, got confirmed um, Stephen Mortimer Locke, I believe, from NIHR. Yeah. Um, and, but in general, um, I think we've also got NHS Digital for both the 10th and the 24th. Um, right. But yes, yeah, so I think the theme for the next one is actually around data and dashboards. Cool. So NHS are, NIHR have an open data portal that's not quite open. So we'll, we'll wind them up about that um, when, they, when they join us. Um, but they've, built, they've been building dashboards about research for themselves. So um, some, some great work um, that they want to share and, and we can all learn from. 
Um, and then the following uh, week with, uh, session, which is part of, uh, is that the one that's part of uh, Leeds Digital Festival, Amy? Uh, that's right, yes, on the 24th. So we've got um, three speakers. We've got uh, hopefully someone from TPP who are talking about the Open Safely work they did with Ben Goldacre uh, to build a, you know, a massive um, uh, database of um, GPs data so that Ben Goldacre could, could do his analysis of what of the COVID um, impacts are on different types of people, but they've done it in an open way that he can share. Um, 24 million records. Uh, it's absolutely amazing. And um, I'm really interested in how that was all put together. So TPP are going to tell us about that. Uh, Tom Reardon, Chief Exec of Lee City Council, is going to talk about the um, test and trace stuff he was working on. Um, so that's going to be uh, interesting. And I think either Alistair or Jessica from NHS Digital are going to be talking about the open data portal or uh, portals dashboards data that they've they've worked on um nhs digital and what's going to happen next so um, that's part of lee's digital festival and that's quite an exciting uh, session that we're doing so we're at five past eleven and we're going to try and uh, keep to time um if people join us they will just have to catch up but we're videoing all of this um so people can do that if you've got any questions please put them in the chat and we'll sweep them up uh, at the end um, hopefully you will have some questions and we can um, we can move that forward. So, um, uh, Amy, just remind me of the order. So it's Anna first, then Tom, then Henry. Is that right? That's the order I added them to the agenda, but obviously we can be quite flexible. Cool. So Anna, if you are uh, ready to go. So Anna Powell-Smith, um, if you just introduce yourself and um, tell us all about the work you're doing. Um, hi, uh, yeah, um, I'm Anna Powell-Smith. Um, I'm the founder of the new organisation, the Centre for Public Data. Um, Paul's very kindly asked me to talk about it. Um, Paul, can I share my screen? Yes, please do. I will stop sharing. Okay, um, bear with me. Okay, share. Can you see my screen now? We can see your screen and I will now go on mute. Amazing. Uh, right, so our mission is, um, I'll just say I'm, I'm a data scientist by background. Um, I spent the last three years working at a startup called Flourish, which does data visualization software. Before that, I was the founding technical lead at the evidence-based data, evidence data lab with Ben Goldacre. Um, so I've been using data a lot and thinking about data a lot, and that's where this comes from, really. Um, so we are the Centre for Public Data. Our mission is better UK public data via legislation. Um, we have a practical focus and our two goals are better public data by legislation, which I'll talk about today, and then working to fill gaps in public data. And obviously there's a million ways you could make public data better and it's an enormous, probably the most important public policy topic there is. Um, we're focusing on the very specific legislative focus. Um, so as everybody here, I don't need to tell you, you know, there's a problem with public data. Um, we know that MPs and ministers can't find things out that they need to know about their own policies. You know, we're hearing from people in government. We spent, you know, millions on broadband uh, expansion and we don't know where the money's gone, if it's worked. Um, the National Audit Office last year wrote a report, challenges in data across government, which identified a whole series of failures caused by data problems. Um, and obviously COVID's brought lots of data shortcomings into the spotlight um, and the kind of work that Tom and people have been doing is highlighting some of those problems. Um, what's interesting at the moment is there is interest from um, central government in fixing some of this. So we're getting Michael Gove making speeches, talking about publishing more data, which is great. Um, and really, you know, really engaging with it. Um, quick case study on the kind of problems we've seen um, and where legislation fits in. So universal credit, the biggest reform to welfare in a generation, so big you can see it from space, was the official tagline. Um, the Welfare Reform Act 2012, which is enormously long, and the universal credit regulations 2013, which follow, um, redesign the system you know, from the ground up. Um, but they say nothing at all about reporting what's going on. There's no mandate to do that. There's no requirement to do that. Um, we started out with quite good sort of aims on publishing data. Um, but what we got was not, um, was not that, and adequate data was not collected and published on what was going on. Um, and you had campaigners saying, we're seeing people on the ground, 
really struggling, not being paid, having to go to food banks. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, the government could kind of dismiss that and say it's not evidence, it's anecdote. Um, and the Working Pensions Committee started asking questions like, how many people are being paid late? How late are they being paid? What's the impact it's having on them? You know, we know that job centres are referring people to food banks. Are you counting that? Are you counting people being made homeless? Um, and the committee couldn't get answers to its questions. And if you read the transcripts, they're quite scathing about, um, about the lack of data that's being collected. Um, and also, the NEO again reported, we wouldn't know how much it would cost and whether it actually saved money. Um, so this was a kind of a government failure to collect and publish data on its own policies, um, which had you know, enormous harm. Um, so our theory of change is that the causes of this problem are institutional and technical. Um, and they both come down to data is not a primary part of policy making. It tends to be something that's thought about afterwards. Um, and because it's not there right at the beginning in the legislation, there's no mandate to do it. And so institutionally, it's, you know, other things compete for priority. It's not always a top priority. It's kind of left to analysts to think about, you know, start out with the best one in the world, but everyone knows that life is busy and full of priorities. Um, and also technically, if you're not thinking about data right at the start when you're building the system, you may not collect what you need. You may, it may be that the system's owned by a third party, if it's outsourced and they own the data, you know, you've got to think about it right from the beginning. Um, so our approach is um, try and work with legislators to say, as you're putting an act through parliament, you know, it'd be really great to have some provisions in there about, you know, just, um, publishing the right kind of data um, and asking civil servants to do that. And what we don't want to do, obviously, is kind of be really prescriptive and say, you've got to collect exactly this because that would be too inflexible, but just make sure it's in there from the start. Um, and there are areas of legislation where this is really good at the moment. So a lot of environmental legislation is very strong on data, um, as I'm sure people here know. Um, air quality data is great. Um, uh, yeah, a lot of a lot of environmental data is really really strong and has had lots of um, lots and lots of impact. Um, and other areas are kind of weaker. Um, but the ultimate aim is just to end the era of data as a sort of afterthought, um, and relying on ministerial powers, which you know I think as we've seen haven't always been enough. Um, so our current area of focus is the agriculture bill, um, which is going through parliament at the moment. Um, and this bill reforms the funding system for farmers. It's actually it's really good. Um, environmental groups are really happy. Um, so farmers are going to stop being paid for the area of land they own, and they're going to start being paid for the environmental goods they deliver. Um, so it's going to fund things like soil quality, wildlife, public access to the countryside, um, deliverable outcomes. Uh, unfortunately, one thing the bill does is it removes the current provisions about publishing data on what's happening, and it makes them optional. Um, and then in terms of the secondary legislation, which defines what may be published, um, it's not brilliant. It doesn't have any mention of geospatial data, which is really, really crucial for this. Um, and it's not great about beneficiary data. It's actually weaker than it is at present. Um, and this is a real shame because if you had good geospatial data on where this you know, billions of pounds of money was going and what it was being used for, you could imagine not only that then kind of being combine satellite data to say is it working you can imagine a whole kind of ecosystem of companies working with farmers to say you know we can help you deliver what you need to do and monitor it and see if it's working um, so it's really really like you know it's really important data um, so we're trying to work with um, interest groups and legislators just to say look you know you've got to start thinking about this um, so that's our first area of focus. Um, we've been looking at the 1.1 million words of upcoming legislation. Um, this is the current bill size by word count. Um, and we're trying to pick which other bills to look at because there's loads. Um, so here are some of the things we're thinking about. Um, and if anybody here has particular kind of interest in any of these areas, it'd be great to chat. Um, what's interesting is that there's three bills that establish new regulators. So the Building Safety Bill, which is a post-Grenfell bill, sets a new regulator, the Online Harms Bill about regulating Facebook and Twitter, the Environment Bill, they're all establishing new UK regulators who will have the power to use data to kind of, um, you know, uh, police these companies a little bit. Um, and thinking about how data operates in that is going to be super important. Um, it's also a rental reform bill coming up um, about the rental, rental system. There's a rail white paper. There's a couple of white papers uh, later this year about um, 
uh, leveling up and the internal market in which data is going to be super important. Um, so again, if anyone has kind of expertise or interest in those, it'd be great to chat. Um, and, and yeah, and we're, we're brand new. Um, we've got funding from the Joseph Rancher Reform Trust. Um, our goal is to work collaboratively with organizations who can use this data to make sure it's useful. And we're just going to talk to as many people as possible about um, the things that are happening and what they might like to see um, and legislators who are interested in making legislation fit for 21st century. Um, so that's it really. Um, thank you. Yeah, that's, that's it. Amazing. And a bit of a round of applause just for having the gumption to, to get this done. So we are, um, uh, as you know, uh, ODI Leads is all about doing rather than talking, um, writing a, white, a policy paper or a canvas that other people can do or telling other people what they should do rather than. Um, so um, that's amazing. Now, what we'll do, we've got a couple of questions in the, in the chat, which we'll take now. And then if anyone else has got a, a question for Anna, um, please um, add that to the chat. And if something comes to you, we'll, pick, we'll do another sweep at the end. So we've got um, uh, this question from uh, Mark Farr, which is around um, um, data through policy. So yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to understand that, um, Mark. And then just to think of the one from me is also um, the instinct of government to centralize and how can we get people to think about actually putting things on the web allows other people to join in when they're ready and you have a decentralized way of control. But that does, that does challenge some of the, um, uh, the ways that people think. So Mark, you go first and then Anna, you can think about that decentralized web thinking. Yeah. So just a quick one. Thanks, Paul. So one of the things that Paul and I are building is a kind of like a manifesto of open data saves lives. And one of the pillars of that is building the case for um, it's a good thing to do to link your data together and share it as Paul and I did over WhatsApp when we both had COVID, when we came back from skiing, for example, and, and so on and so on. And I've recently just about got permission to link police data to health data to look at domestic abuse. And in that specific example, the law is sort of the law, but to get people to agree it, you needed to make a kind of ethical argument because when, when you kind of get down into the detail of the law, the language is actually quite loose. It's, you know, it uses quite loose words in a good way, like reasonable and, appropriate and and so on and I didn't feel like we were we had to sort of take account of a legal argument you know is there a legal basis for sharing the data but we almost put that we sort of looked at it and acknowledged it and almost put it to one side and said do you think this is the right thing to do would you stand up in court and defend yourself do you sleep well at night and it was and I, I'm just interested in the language you were using early on about kind of legislation and and I think what you presented sounds brilliant and you know it's we're, we're, we're forming quite an army but I think one of the things we need to try and do is make the case for, you know, data for good, data saves lives, open data saves lives, et cetera. So we need to acknowledge the legislative element, but kind of make a strong, almost like philosophical and ethical argument as well. That's just a, a comment really based on your, some of the language you were using. Uh, just not muted. Yeah, I mean, I agree completely. Um, it's, I think it's both, isn't it? It's um, making sure that the kind of overarching provision of appropriate data for appropriate use is there, which and then the details of what you actually do are going to be impossible always to put in legislation. Mm, um, exactly. And then having it focused kind of in people's minds as a legislative priority, but also as a lower down as a, um, you know, this is a massively important thing for us to do um, on a practical level. And we don't have those practical details of legislation, but, um, um, but yeah. I mean, there are examples of it being legislation and failing, I think. Um, so, you know, putting legislation is definitely not enough. Um, but I think it's, it's kind of an important element to have. Yeah, yeah I think you can both. That's my, that's my thought. Fantastic. Okay. So, uh, thanks very much, Anna. Um, we obviously support what you're doing and anything anyone can do to help. Um, I think there's a... Um, um, it's all on the web on the Centre for Public Data. And I think the, the this... Um, building the infrastructure so that we can um, address real world problems and also um, fix stuff um, in a decentralized way is, is, um, is amazing. And we, we, you know, we'd love to have you back when we've got some uh, successes on, the, um, uh, on what you're doing. So that, that's, that's brilliant. But the next uh, lightning talk that we've got is Tom White, um, who's gonna talk us through how he built um, an amazing repo and the pain he went through and the, and the successes he had of collating all of the 
the data around COVID from the disparate um, madness of, um, of the UK. So over to you, Tom. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Paul. Thanks for the introduction and uh, thank you for inviting me to talk today. Um, I've got a few slides, so I'm going to share those as well if I can. Um, uh, yes, that works. Yep, can you see that? Cool. Um, yeah, so very briefly, um, my background is uh, I'm a programmer. Uh, I work in distributed systems. I've done a lot of work on Hadoop, uh, so data infrastructure, really. But yeah, this, this is um, something slightly different. Um, the title, I don't know where the title came from. It was suggested by someone, maybe Paul, and I thought, yeah, I'll use that. It's fine. Good. Thank you. Um, and... Yeah, so if we go back to uh, early March, which obviously is a long time ago now and feels like a long time ago, um, the, the, what we were receiving was this kind of information. This is a, a, a screenshot from um, a web page from the Public Health Wales website at the time. And as you can see, it was very, it was just some text. So it was basically a, a re press release saying, you know, what the number of cases were. And it was very small um, uh, at that time. And the thing that I noticed was that um, this web page would be updated every day and no one seemed to remember the previous numbers. And I was a bit worried that no one was really tracking this. Of course they were, but it wasn't being made publicly available. So like probably lots of people, I started tracking these numbers in a, I was doing it in a repository in GitHub. I'm a programmer. It seemed like the natural place to do it. Um, and every day it would change a little bit, you know, the text would change so they've kind of moved on and given a break breakdown by local authority here um, using words rather than numbers which is you know nice but made it a bit more difficult um, but the the problem I was really trying to solve was that it seemed like the the four nations so the four devolved nations uh, England Wales Scotland and Northern Ireland um, were all doing things differently they all had different web pages um, almost everything that could be different was different. So the reporting times were different. Every day it would be a different time when they reported numbers. The period would be different. So it, that would be reflected in the reporting time. The frequency, Northern Ireland wouldn't re report at the weekends, for example. All the different data formats. Um, the granularity of the data was very different as well. So local authorities versus health boards, that would depend on, that would change over time as well. Um, and then there were different data definitions, and I'll get into that a little bit more in a minute. Um, and the key things that I was tracking or I was interested in were tests, confirmed cases, and deaths. Um, and initially, it was really about testing because it seemed to me and, and lots of people, I think, that we really weren't testing enough. So, you know, keeping track of that and, and seeing if it was increasing was, was something that I think a lot of people were, were worried about. Um, so in terms of kind of how it evolved, I've just described that I started by just collecting some numbers, but I think one of the things I was doing that um, in retrospect was, was a bit different was I was really focusing on collecting the data. I, I wasn't so much interested in producing charts for public consumption. I mean, I did produce a few charts, but they were mainly for myself just to, to see what was happening, but also they proved very useful for testing that the data was uh, was was you know correct in some sense it was like a sanity check on on the data that that was coming out um, particularly for some of the code that I wrote to to do the processing so and I and that's probably why this took off a little bit is because lots of people were producing charts and you know they needed the source of data so rather than kind of everyone replicate the, the data processing bit I think um, my repository became um, quite popular. And really, I was just doing the simplest thing. I, um, I was producing a CSV that looked like this. It had four columns, date, tests, confirmed cases and deaths. And that was it. Um, I mean, there was one for each nation and there was a combined one as well. And I also did breakdowns by area, but this was the data structure. And, you know, it's very simple. People complain a lot about CSVs, but actually there are no you know, 
there's a lot of technology for processing them and that's that's all you need and so it's quite interesting to hear you talking about the api that public health england produced and which breaks all the time and i just i, I do worry that that's kind of over complex for for some of these things um one of the other kind of it wasn't so much a decision but it kind of emerged over over time was my approach of basically writing parsers uh, to parse the information from the the um, data sources and produce a unified data set that way um, there's a kind of alternative approach which is more of a crowdsourcing approach which i think was used a bit more certainly initially in america for their coving tracking project where they've got 50 states and they had lots of people lots of journalists as well kind of ring up the people who had the data and kind of type it into spreadsheets and, and crowdsource and collate it in that way and i i didn't go that way i've had <clears throat> quite a lot of experience working on open source projects and uh, and writing code so you know my kind of approach was to write some code and maybe you know take contributions and i was quite open for that but but it, as it turned out not many people kind of got involved but um not because I was against it, but that's just the way it kind of panned out, I think. So I used, I'm not gonna go through all of the different types of technology I used, but here's a kind of quick snapshot of what, what I did. And it was, you know, basic well-known technology, Python and GitHub and, and, um, and pretty standard things. And I got to a point eventually where the parsers just worked. The, the data formats improved. You know, it wasn't um, the public health agencies publishing web pages anymore. It was, you know, CSV files and Excel files and, and you know, more parsable formats. So I got to a point where it was possible to essentially automate it and it, and it, it basically ran by itself. So that was kind of the technical side. I think the, the biggest challenge for the whole thing was, was really about the meaning of what these you know very simple words actually what, what they meant and how that changed over time and how it differed between different um, uh, different devolved nations so if you just take the word tests I mean there's been a lot of discussion about this in the media and initially it kind of did just mean the number of people tested and that's what I think most people would understand it to mean then I mean, there were variants on that. Wales always said that it was the number of people tested in a six week period because they had this kind of system that, that had that restriction. But, you know, that, that's still OK, I think. And then it got twisted and it was the number of samples tested, the number of test kits dispatched, the amount of test capacity. It was it was really difficult to kind of keep a handle on what what it actually meant. And often as the as the pandemic kind of progressed there was uh, more data was being was being published and and multiple um metrics were being published so the word tests just didn't didn't capture it anymore so i tried to keep it to number of people tested but but then that proved problematic because that figure wasn't published anymore by for certain parts of of england for example so then the other kind of big um, controversy was, was this, what, what's called the pillar two um, tests and, and cases. And pillar two was where um, commercial partners were doing the, the testing and it was a different system. And what kind of emerged was that there was this gap and this, this um, visualization kind of shows what the gap is. Um, where the n total number of cases reported for the UK was much higher than the sum of the cases for the four nations. And it kind of became apparent in April, and then it really was very obvious in, in early May. Like, there were lots of questions um, on Twitter, on GitHub. The Guardian kind of picked this up, and a couple of their journalists, Severin Carroll and Helen Pidd, kind of did some investigations and reports on it. But it didn't really, I was surprised actually that, that it didn't really take off in the media um, because it seemed like a big scandal. And it took another six weeks or so before it really was, was actually resolved. And this is another visualization which shows in dark blue 
the pillar one um, tests. So those are done by the NHS laboratories. And then pillar two is the, the light blue. And that was kind of hidden for all of this time until right at the end when suddenly the government did publish the pillar two data. And in the context, the, the, the reason I think it kind of came, came up is because um, of the last lockdown. Um, and actually it was, it was John Byrne Murdoch who I think um, did some reporting on it and it kind of got traction at that point. Anyway, so in the context of my repository, I was, I was kind of very worried about this and concerned because I felt that the data that I was publishing was not representative of what was actually happening on the ground. And so I was in this kind of slight quandary about whether I should publish it, even though it kind of documented the limitations, but I still think people were using it and not really understanding necessarily what, what it meant. And in the case of Leicester, for example, you know, if you lived in Leicester and you wanted to look at the data, you'd say, well, actually, why are we being locked down? It's going down if you look at the dark blue. But if you look at the light blue, no, it's actually going up and that justifies the lockdown. So I actually did stop publishing that data for a few days and then it, uh, the, the, the government, you know, did publish it and I started publishing it again. Um, anyway, so just to kind of finish off, I, in August, it was about five months after I'd, um, started publishing and initially I'd, I'd, I'd done it because um, I wanted to kind of provide some data that was not being published properly by the, the um, public health agencies and I imagined it would be a few weeks and then they'd publish some CSV files and I stopped doing it but it took a lot longer for, to get there um, but in, a, in, in August I did think that the the data was sufficiently it wasn't perfect obviously but it was sufficiently kind of available that um, this um, repository was you know was was worth deprecating and, and encouraging people to kind of move to upstream sources and you know just in summary I think the the publishing is a lot better than than you know back in March um, but there are still lots of problems. And I think the major problem is the fragmentation problem. It hasn't been solved. There's no entity that is there to, to solve it really. So it's not surprising that we have four different systems and they're, that they will still all use different technologies and they still have problems like some of them still use unstable URLs. So you can't discover, you have to kind of get a new URL each day for a, a different data file, which is very annoying. And the definitions are still very um, complex um, and need lots of interpretation. Um, so I think all of those problems still stand. Um, the other thing that's changed, of course, is that we have a lot more data now. So when we started out, it was just a few basic numbers, but we have lots of different data. And I never tried to kind of keep on top of that. So you have to go to these other sources anyway to get things like excess deaths or hospitalization numbers. And I think the other thing that we're kind of focused on at this stage of the pandemic is that we're, we're really interested in outbreaks in, in local areas. And there are some very good kind of apps that, that are doing that. Um, I've mentioned a couple here. The, the COVID Zoe app is, is very good. Um, symptom tracker. And then Russ Garrett's got a really nice page, which is a coronavirus um, tracker map with, with um, which you can drill down and see um, cases. So I'm just going to finish by saying that one of the, the big positives for me was, was kind of getting in touch with the um, data community in the UK um, through COVID and meeting lots of people, having discussions on, on Twitter and GitHub and email. I, I received lots of email over this, this period and that, that, was, that had certainly helped me um, of continue when, when I was having these frustrations with some of the data. And I was also very pleased that the Financial Times, John Byrne Murdoch kind of used my data at one point and I even got a mention on the Financial Times webpage next to the Brazilian Ministry of Health and the National Health Commission of China, which was, was quite nice. So thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to take any questions at, at the end or, or now.
again, massive round of applause. I think um, you did what was needed. And it's amazing that, as you said, you built a better data set, data asset than was available from government. Um, Thank you. I'm not going to go into the whys and wherefores and why have we got that. But um, so I've got a couple of questions and I think we'll then take some more what's in the, in the chat. So I think I, I, on behalf of everyone, uh, thank you. Um, and it's, it's great that we've made friends with you as well. So Odi Leeds has made another friend um, in, in, in data, which is amazing. And Open Data Saves Lives has. So has anyone from uh, Public Health England, NHSX, Digital or England been in touch? No. So the person who has built the best data asset for uh, the UK and in integrated all of the different parts of the NHS has not been spoken to by... Um, no, I anyone. mean, I, I, I did have a few early contacts with Public Health England, but I think it was... Uh, and, and, I, and with some people at ONS, but it was, it was mainly people who were consuming the data. Yeah. It wasn't people who so were... They were using your data. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. It, I haven't had any meaningful discussions about about any of the... you know. The and, and I'm guessing all the code you use to build it is on... I think it's all available, isn't it? There's yeah, I mean, I mean, I, yeah, I hope that... I mean, another thing that I think is useful, maybe in the future, like in mm -hmm. several years' time, is coming back and looking at the... the it will be a useful kind of archive of how things evolved because it's got all of the history of the of yeah. some of the, those web pages over time so i think that might be quite a nice asset for historians one day well but i guess it's also a, a how we so anna you know talk about how we're building data infrastructure and, and every time everyone wants to build we must build a new portal we must centralize the thing and build the thing and i must own the thing um uh, and it must be controlled by a governance committee and we must set up the standards before we start and, and lo and behold, nothing ever happens, you know, um, it, it, that, yeah. that's, yeah. I mean, one thing that I thought Scotland did very well is they actually started publishing CSV files very early on GitHub, yes. which, is, which is all I wanted. I mean, it took a while to get there, but when it's great. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, but why would we, you know, so I think that's one of the other things is, um, it may be nice. I don't know we, if um, uh, we're off, uh, we're hopefully going to be publishing your slides on on the Open Data Says Lives page, and uh, maybe if you're up for it, we could write a blog post um, uh, with you to to share some of that um, information and and maybe point to where the code is that maybe if if someone in the NHS wanted to pull that together, to show how how you can pull lots of disparate parts of the system together without having to have a lot of conference calls and meetings and governance committees to, to make it happen. So, um, yeah, be happy yeah. to. Thanks. Yeah. That'd be fantastic. So we've got a couple, uh, of, um, lots of people congratulating you, um, which is, uh, uh amazing. Um, and I can't see, uh, are there any actually specific questions? There's one there, um, Mark about died with and died from, um, yeah, um, just very quickly, I don't know, Hog. Um, I yeah. think it was ama amazing, Tom. Um, at, being within the NHS, one of the conundrums daily is is definitions. So suspected COVID or oxygen flow, you wouldn't believe the amount, we would believe the amount of phone calls I have about how we define things. Um, and I'm kind of interested in what you've brought is a pace to something about getting data together. And I wonder if there's a, a, a parallel pace that we could bring to defining things because you get you get some government guidance, but it's so loose and it's so local locally interpreted that it it's, it's sort of meaningless. And the, and the big issue, which is kind of bubbling up at the moment for us, that I looked at a few months ago, and now people have kind of got interested in, is died from and died with. And I can do patient by patient clinical audit on that, but it would be really cool if we could kind of almost crowdsource our findings and you know get to definitions quicker of suspected or died from or died with um because i think everything we're doing you know looking at death certificates going through notes is is quite manual but actually it's becoming more quantitative you know the data out of death certificates you can get and which line of death to death certificate is says so whether it was an underlying cause or it was the overriding cause and and so on but i just i kind of echo people's thoughts but i just the thing i'll take away is to think about how we how we speed up definitions because that just sucks so much time out of you talked to it with tests and that's a relatively simple example something more nuanced around suspected covid 
um, or died from or died with, which are softer. Um, I wonder if we can collaborate to get definitions more quickly on those. Yeah, thanks, I mean, thanks, my, my only comment would be about can you use the kind of GitHub, you know, software process, open source processes, and bring that to bear on on that process of definition itself. Yeah. I don't know. Who knew that you could yeah. use the web to I collaborate know. <laughs> and talk to each other? I mean, yeah. it's amazing. But it does, works really does well. Does the web exist? Yeah. Maybe we could use future NHS to go back to the 90s. But anyway, now that's me ranting on about that. But um, if anyone else has got um, a good, uh, any more questions, please put them in the chat. Um, and um, again, thanks very much, Tom, and we'll, we'll, we'll shout about all that work uh, at Open Data Saves Lives. Next up, um, our friends at um, the Data Lab. So Henry, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Yeah, hello. So as well as, so some of the stuff I've been using, as well as the data that Tom was producing, I was using your um, uh, visualizations to help me communicate to my mum about whether it was actually a problem in North Yorkshire and Scarborough. Um, and lo and behold, there was a great um, app that could show her that it wasn't that much of a problem. So right. Henry, if you could tell us about the great work you've done and also how you've made it open and shareable and anyone could use, that'd be amazing. Thank you. Sure, okay. I'll just share my screen and show you my prepared slides. Yeah, again, just and then just 30 seconds on what Trafford Data Lab is as well. That'll be yeah, good. cool. Okay, well, I'm Henry Partridge, uh, manager of the Trafford Data Lab. We're based in, well, funded and based by Trafford Council in Greater Manchester. Uh, we're a small team uh, and we basically use open data, publish open data, and create uh, visualizations and dashboards and apps using open source tools to provide insight to the council residents. And we try and scale up some of our apps and dashboards so that other local authorities can use them as well, as hopefully we'll demonstrate in, in these slides. Um, let me just... Sorry, I've got to give security permissions to share my... Sorry. <laughs> no worries, Henry. If, um, if it re becomes really problematic, I have got them... Uh, loaded up on my screen well, ready great. to share yeah, if that's that. easier yeah, yeah. yep bear with me said so just tell me when uh, i need to change slides okay. thank you now just there great. we go okay so it's called decentralizing covid19 reporting with our shiny next next please okay so you probably remember this from March, April time. This is the official dashboard uh, produced by Public Health England, uh, created in ArcGIS. Um, you know, as far as it goes, it's, it's fine, it's clear. Uh, but we, we, we thought maybe we could do better than this. Uh, next slide. And here's another output from uh, another government department. This is uh, LG Inform. This is... Uh, uh, screenshot from one of the, their dashboard, which is showing local authority level uh, cases and covered related deaths. Um, I won't pass judgment on the particular chart design, uh, but um, I don't particularly like it. And again, I wanted to see if we could improve on this. Next slide. The key reasons that I don't particularly, I'm not particularly keen on either of those outputs, those dashboards, are one, Neither of them are open source. Uh, one's using IGIS. I'm not sure what the other one is using, the LG Inform. Uh, and as a consequence, they're not reproducible and not scalable. So here's an example in the next slide of an output that, that is. Produced by John Ben Murdoch, uh, the Financial Times. Um, he using, is using data from the, uh, John Hopkins University which, uh, like Tom was mentioning, it's available on, on GitHub as a CSV uh, and regularly updated. So he's using open data. He's also using ggplot, which is a, a graphics package in R, which is a programming language. Uh, and if you go to the next slide, he makes the code used to create that chart available in a gist on GitHub. So it's reproducible and it's scalable because I can just tweak the code and, and visualize different countries uh, rather than the ones he's decided to show. So using that as a model, 
uh, we decided to create our own apps that were reproducible and could be scaled uh, using R. So next slide. So two of the apps I'm showing you here, we've got the, the local COVID app and a COVID-19 monitor. They're kind of interchangeable, the names, I couldn't come up with decent names. Um, but the, the main idea is that uh, you're provided with a, a local authority snapshot uh, of the COVID data. So cases uh, from Public Health England and deaths published by Office for National Statistics. On the left-hand side, the local COVID-19 allows you to drill down uh, quite granular level in terms of the different types of data sets, uh, local authority level. On the right-hand side is kind of an early warning system, which shows you the weekly change in coronavirus cases at a local authority level. It gives you uh, some day moving average and, and a map. Uh, again, both of these are written in, in R shiny, so they're reproducible. The next slide, please. Uh, and it turns out these apps have been quite popular. So the, uh, we host them on what's called shinyapps.io and they provide some useful metrics. The metrics at the top for application usage relate to an app that is Traffic Council's corporate dashboard. You can see that's not very popular uh, over the last week in comparison to the bottom one, which is the local COVID-19 app, which has had over 100 hours of usage in the last week. So it's getting a lot of action. Uh, next slide. And that's borne out by some of the positive feedback that we have had on, on Twitter from complete strangers, people working in uh, other local authorities, uh, NHS, Health Foundation, etc. Uh, which is really heartwarming that people are using the apps. Um, and the Karen Hodgson at the bottom is seems, her dad seems to be using it for the same purpose that your uh, father is Paul, which is interesting. Um, next slide. Again, it's reproducible. It's all done in R. So we post all the code on GitHub in dedicated repos for each of the uh, applications. Uh, and it turns out that um, some people are forking this code. Well, not, not, uh, not um, discreetly, I'd say, because it says zero forks. But uh, next slide, please. Essex County Council has. Uh, uh, rebranded, adapted our code uh, of one of our apps for their own purposes for, for Essex, which is, which is brilliant. Which basically means it's, it's doing what we intended it to do. Um, sharing the code, making it reproducible. Somebody can adapt it to their own purposes, uh, which, is, which is brilliant. Uh, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Again, another round of applause from me and everyone else, because that's, you know, it's ex exactly what Open Exercise is all about. And it's an example of real stuff being built to answer real questions. And um, why shouldn't Essex be using your code to deliver what they're doing there? Um, they, and I hope there's a big attribution. Um, uh, yeah, at the bottom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah they're, didn't they're, know they were doing it. I Googled it. Uh, and found it. Yeah, Google found it, but yeah, they should let you know. And maybe there's something um, around how we how we share that. But you know, um, myself and others around Open Data Science have, have discussed how do we scale and build useful stuff for people um, without having to you know um, procure something in Kent and Carlisle at the same time. You know, and get away from the, the we need to keep IT out of. Um, um, digital and data, you know, the, the, the way we share that. So that's, it's, it's amazing and a great example. And again, I've got a question. Has anyone from um, uh, Public Health England, NHS, D, E and X uh, approached you about using your code or, or um, accessing it? Uh, well, we've, early, in the early days, we had uh, a, a veterinary school from the University of Edinburgh who right, okay. um, approached us. They wanted to use our uh, code from one of our initial apps and they adapted it to visualize Scot uh, data coronavirus cases in Scotland, which is great. But in terms of uh, Public Health England, I work closely with the Public Health England team at the local council and I'm supporting them with the surveillance data at the moment. Uh, and they use our tools in stakeholder briefings. And so, yeah, Excellent. they're actively using our materials. Cool, cool, which is good. Okay, so. Um... 
uh, lots of people sharing uh, stuff in the in the chat, which is, which is amazing. And also, um, uh, we do record all of the sessions, and the slides do go up in line, Mark. So sharing them with your analysts is going to be um, uh, really easy. Um, and um, uh, Henry, just could, maybe you could share with us what you're doing next, or what the what's your next priority at the Trafford Data Lab are working on. Well, uh, currently I, I volunteer to work with the public health team at Trafford, um, uh, pro producing daily briefings, stakeholder meeting briefings, and ad hoc analysis. And my head's completely in COVID data at the moment. Can't think of anything else. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. So we'll, we'll um, again, we'll share your slides and the, the links to the repo on the Open Data Slides page. And right, again, we you. might have a chat with you about putting a blog post up about how you built that because it, one of the things I'm really passionate about is actually um, putting technical blog posts up about what we do so that it's really easy to find um, now and in the future about what we've all built um, um, and using the web as it was designed rather than um, leaving it to uh, marketing and communications people to, uh, uh, to lock up um, stuff on the, on the web. So uh, that's amazing. So we're, we're five minutes over, um, unfortunately. Um, are there any, uh, would anyone like to make a point or, or add something to the, to the session? Uh, please uh, let us know now, otherwise we'll, we'll try and finish on time. Okay, I can't see any um, hands up or questions. So uh, please join us in the next one. We'll, we'll send you the information. Uh, we've got one in two weeks time and then one after that. We're gonna run these um, every uh, couple of weeks from, from now on. And um, as Mark said, we're also um, looking for people to join our merry band of building um, open data sales lives into a thing that can um, really make an impact in the world of health and social care and get people thinking about data and the web um, properly and in a decentralized way. Fantastic. Thanks so much, everyone. And a round of applause to our speakers again. Cheers. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, <sighs> no.